So guys, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all for braving the wind and coming out this evening. My name is Mark Fensel, and I'm the fisheries supervisor down in the Fort Pier office. Our office manages the fisheries of Lake Oahe, Lake Sharp, and the surrounding small impoundments. Uh, we also have John Lott here, who is our fisheries chief of our section. We have Jake Davis, who's program administrator for uh, management practices within South Carolina Game Fishing Parks. We have two of our biologists from Fort Pier, Dylan Gravenhoff, Liz Renner. We have Nick Harrington, who is an avid fisherman, but is also our communications specialist over at the, uh, the Foss building. Good leader. And then we have, uh, <laughs> we have three COs in the back, and I want to thank them for coming. Uh, Officer Carr, Officer Dunlap, and I saw Officer Floor, just, just Officer Floor right over. We also have a few people from Parks. Um, I just saw Ryan. Yep. Uh, we have three people here from the Parks. So if you guys see us around, especially after this meeting, feel free to walk up to any of us, ask us any questions you guys might have about uh, fisheries, the parks, law enforcement, you know, any, any questions. So kind of the way this meeting is going to go tonight is that we have a short PowerPoint. We're going to give a uh, kind of an overview of Lake Oahe, um, what has happened historically, um, coming up to about 2017 when we started stocking Lake Oahe, you know, what caused us to, or what was the the triggers that made us start stocking Lake Oahe in 2017. Uh, go over what we've been stocking, how many, stuff like that, where we've been stocking. I know that's a big question. Um, look at some of the current walleye trends, and I mean current by the last five or six years. So after we started stocking Lake Oahe, what's going on with the fishery? Um, talk about our plans going forward, uh, primarily our stocking plans going forward over the next, uh, at least next year and the next four or five years short term. And then after that, we will have bunch of time to answer any questions you guys might have, okay? So South Dakota Game Fish and Parks splits Lake Oahe in two, into two management zones. We have the upper zone, which essentially runs from the 212 bridge right here up to the, the border. Um, and the lower zone, which is essentially the 212 bridge down to the dam. Now these two zones, we kind of manage them distinctly because they, they have very distinct walleye populations or um, characteristics. Upper Lake Oahe, we generally see, again, going past, back in history, we generally see higher abundance. So there's a lot more fish out there in Upper Lake Oahe. Smaller size structure compared to the lower zone. So you have a lot more fish, but they're not as large as the ones in the lower zone. And then good recruitment, consistent recruitment. There's always new fish historically coming into the system. And on Lower Oahe, it's pretty much the exact opposite, right? Numbers are always, or I shouldn't say always, most of the time numbers on Lower Oahe is less than what we see in Upper Oahe. Larger size structure, we see a lot of bigger fish on that lower end. And then uh, weak recruitment. So very rarely do we pull off good year classes on Lower Lake Oahe. Um, we do every few years and there's always just a trickle of walleye coming in. So there's just fewer, fewer fish on the lower end in most years. So we manage them as two distinct units, Upper Oahe and Lower Oahe. So going into this presentation, again, when I say Upper Oahe, that's 212 bridge to the, er, to the border. Now I wanna jump right into some of our historical data, okay? Um, one of the most important things we look at is just abundance, and this is the number of fish we catch in our gill nets. So every year we go out to nine sites on Lake Oahe, we set gill nets, this year we are lucky enough to have Bill Hines and Bill Wackerly come out with us at Swan Creek. We got to brave the elements and see some of the, the work we do, but um, set a bunch of gill nets and you know, essentially we just count the fish. That's what ab the abundance is, how many fish per net. And that's what this graph is here. We call it CPUE, but it's actually the number of walleye we're catching per net that we set. And we're just looking at this over time. So starting in 1985, and going all the way to about 2015, 2016. A couple of things to note. Again, Upper Oahe is the black, Lower Oahe is the gray, and through time, lower, uh, Upper Oahe generally has more walleye than Lower Oahe. Two big things to note is, you know, this, the trend in the early to mid 90s when we had some of the highest abundances, the highest numbers of walleye we've ever had in Lake Oahe were through that mid 90s time period. We had the first prey fish collapse, the end of the 1990s, and you see that in both the, uh, the upper Oahe and lower Oahe. And then through the mid 2000s, these populations were building. And then the 2011 flood 
you know, had a, a drastic impact on the, the fishery, similar to 1997. Um, one thing to note is, you know, the, the rate that these fish are declining, particularly on lower Oahe, you know, was the fastest we've ever seen. Now that's through entrainment, that's through some harvest, you know, we did liberalize some regulations at, back then, but one of the biggest things that happened was mortality was very high, natural mortality. But if you guys got to fish lower end of Lake Oahe following that big flood, you know, the fish looked about that big. Um, they were just essentially starving to death, right? They didn't have any food out there. Again, right after the flood, lower Oahe really, really um, saw that steep decline in abundance, right? More so than upper Oahe. Another thing we look at when we judge a walleye fishery is the condition. So a walleye's condition is just the relative plumpness of that fish. For a 15 inch fish, how fat is that fish? That is a measure of condition. Um, and we use what's called the WR as a, as a measure of condition. A good WR is anywhere between 80 and 90. You get above that and you start getting really, really big fish. You get below that and you start seeing some, some health effects. You know, when you look at fish that have poor condition, Below 80, those are fish that are just not finding enough food, okay? And you follow it through time for both, again, this is gonna be upper Oahe, lower Oahe, uh, the, the conditions right here, this is about 80, this is about 90, and as long as you're kinda of around this area, those fish are, are healthy fish. Same story that we talked about with abundance, you know, fish were very healthy going into the early um, even in the late 1990s until we had that first prey collapse in 1997. Um, and you see it in both Upper Oahe, you know, fish condition starts to plummet pretty soon after that first prey fish collapse. Lower Oahe was the same, same way, you know, mid 90s, late 90s, and then you start seeing those, the condition, the relative plumpness of those fish just go in the tank. Again, there wasn't enough food out there to support the number of walleye that were in the system. As you go through the, the 2000s, you know, the fish start rebuilding. They start building back those fat reserves. The plumpness starts increasing, um, again, in both upper Oahe and lower Oahe. Uh, but then that 2011 flood hit. And once again, we saw, you know, fish condition drop like you wouldn't believe. Some of uh, the worst condition fish ever recorded for walleye, you know, throughout the state, if not the nation, were captured after that 2011 flood in Lake Oahe. Uh, same thing as abundance, you know, we did see a big drop in Upper Oahe, but the drop in Lower Oahe was, was staggering. They went fast. In a matter of like a year or two, they went from big, healthy, fat fish to very skinny, very unhealthy fish. And that's why you saw that abundance drop, because natural mortality was taking over. They were just starving out there. What is the numbers for the next seven years? Just putting that 15. Yep, I'll get to that in a minute. So this is everything up to about 2015, 2016. So we started stocking in 2017. So we're going to show you later what we've done since we started stocking. One thing to note that even though we saw that collapse soon after that 2011 period um, in both Upper and Lower Oahe, uh, you know a lot of these WRs, uh, the fish condition increased to, to a point that was. Um, acceptable, you know, in our mind, an average fish condition. Uh, pretty soon after, about five, four, five, six years afterwards, condition of those fish was actually returning back to what we would consider, you know, a, a healthy um, population again. Uh, and this was really prominent on uh, lower Oahe. You know, those fish bottomed out and then shot right back up after the, the food started coming back. <coughs> the third thing we look at when we you know, assess our walleye fisheries is uh, length at age. So for this, we're looking at an age three fish. So all the walleye that we collect, we remove a little bone from inside their head called an otolith, it's their ear bone. And then just like the rings on a tree, you can actually cut it in half and age that fish to find out how old that fish is. So to standardize it, we look at all the, the age three fish out there and take the average length of an age three fish. In some years when there's good food, good growth, you know, those fish are longer at age three. Now when, you know, food is limiting, growth's not good, you know, those fish are shorter at age three. Now we're gonna give you some, it, it varies year to year, again, based on food and stuff like that. 
Uh, and I'm going to give you some examples of some of the other lakes out there that, uh, as far as what the, the average length at age three is. So like Angostura out west, you know, they're hitting uh, 17 inches by three years of age. Belfouche, again, out west, just under 15 inches. Lake Thompson, over east, is about 14 inches. Sinai, another eastern lake, 14 inches. Francis Case, which is just below Lake Sharp, another one of our large reservoirs, uh, they're just over 15 inches in, in three years. And Lewis and Clark, you know, over the last few years has actually had some of the best growth we've seen for, for age three fish. And they're hitting about 17 and a half, 17, 17 and a half inches in three years. So that's some, some phenomenal growth. So where does Lake Oahe uh, match up with this? Oh, I should say, one thing I want to note is that these top three, so Lewis and Clark, Angostura, Francis Case, even Belle Fouche, these are gizzard shad driven um, prey, uh, walleye fisheries, all right? So these fish are primarily eating gizzard shad. Compared to some of your eastern lakes where they're eating perch and centarchids and stuff like that, um, some of our best growth, especially for those first three, four years, come out of lakes that um, have gizzard shad as a prey resource. So this is what a Lake Oahe looked like over time. This is the length of an H3 fish through time. So in the early 2000s, again, following that first prey fish collapse, we were down to about 14 inches. So a fish that was three years old was hitting 14 inches. As that fishery grew, the prey fish came back, smelt started returning, we had a lot of gizzard shad in the system. We were actually topping out at some of those bigger, you know, 17, 17 and a half inch fish by three years. Um, and then of course that, that second prey fish collapse hit and those fish returned to, you know, 14 inches at, at three years. Um, and this kind of runs a gamut of, you know, the, the best growth, you know, in the state, you know, for the majority of our fisheries to some of the worst in our fisheries as well. But similar to condition, again, the, the plumpness of the fish, their growth has started returning, you know, 2013, 2014, and by 2015, those fish were back up to um, just under 15 inches in about three years. So the, the sites reporting that they were finding food, the fishery had balanced itself, you know, there's a lot fewer fish in the system, the prey fish were coming back, the fish were in good condition, and they were, they were starting to grow well. And again, just want to highlight that in the mid-2000s, yes, we had smelt coming back, but if you guys remember fishing during that time period, gizzard shad were very, very important during this time and really saved us for, again, switching that around and getting those that condition back and that growth back. So looking at a historic summary, so the 80s up to 2015, 2016, um, you know, the following the flood of 2011, you know, we saw abundance drop, you know, and I already mentioned that. Um, and that was dictated by poor condition and they just didn't have enough food out there, okay? Um, but the nice thing is it started to recover fairly quickly. Again, by 2014, 2015, condition, like I showed you, had started to come back up and growth had started to come back up. So what were we left with? We were left with a fishery that had few walleye in the system, but it looked like growth was back on par, right? So we had food for the fish, we just didn't have a lot of food, a lot of fish out there. So what did we do to kind of combat this trend? We started stocking fish, and for game fish and parks, we stocked a lot of fish. So from 2017 to 2022, we stocked 5.7 million fry and almost 5 million small fingerlings, about an inch and a half, two inches, um, in Lake Oahe. Most of those we focused on lower Lake Oahe for two reasons. One, you saw that abundance graph after that flat, that flood, lower Lake Oahe abundance <coughs> dropped fast. Upper, upper Oahe was still dropping, but lower Lake Oahe was dropping um, much faster. The other thing we noticed is that the condition and the growth of fish on lower Lake Oahe was better. There appeared to be more food resources on the lower end. So there was less there was fewer walleye down there, but enough fish to support these, these big stocking events. So we stocked 17 different locations, as far north as Swan Creek, but all the way down to pretty much right on the face of the dam. Up to this point, the last time Lake Oahe was stocked, they did some experimental stockings in like the late 80s, up until I believe it was 91. 
and then walleye were not stocked since 1991 in Lake Oahe. So when you look at those graphs of the abundance going up and down through the 90s, early 2000s, even into you know, 2012, 13, 14, that was all natural reproduction, natural recruitment. You know, we were not um, adding any fish to the system at that time. <coughs> the other thing we did too is we started stocking gizzard shad. Now gizzard shad, I already showed you, you know, a couple of the graphs, but I want to illustrate how important shad was in the recovery after the 1997 <laughs> flood. Um, and I think it's an important part, uh, important component of the walleye fishery right now. There's not a lot of shad out there right now, but we want to try to get those shad numbers back up as high as we can. So immediately after the flood in 2012, we started stocking pre-spawn adult gizzard shad. And so we go out from, go down in Lake Sharp into Hippo Lake, we collect these big females and males, big gizzard shad, and move them up to Lake Oahe so that they spawn, reproduce, and create food for, for walleye. We did that in 2012 through 2022 with some years off intermittently in there. The nice thing about shad is, one of those big female shad can produce almost half a million eggs. So they are, they are very, they call it fecund, they just produce giant amounts of eggs. You don't need a lot of adults out there to really produce a lot of offspring. Again, we focused a lot of our efforts down in you know, lower Lake Oahe, middle Lake Oahe, but the one thing we had during this time, especially in 2012, 2013, 2014, we had these high water periods um, that flooded like Beaver Bay right over the right over the border, um, some of the other bays up in North Dakota. So we worked with our counterparts in North Dakota, Paul Bailey, um, and we actually stocked shad from Lake Sharp into Upper Lake Oahe with the idea that the fish will reproduce and start spreading out in the lake, especially up in Upper Lake Oahe. So that's what we started. 2017, again, we started stocking walleye. 2012, almost immediately after the flood, we started stocking gizzard shad. So what happened since 2017? And again, this is our abundance. This is the number of fish per net over the 2017 through 2022. We just completed our 2022 surveys in September. Again, upper Oahe is black, lower Oahe is gray. Started stocking in 2017, and we start seeing the pendulum sw switch, and we're seeing the number of fish in lower Oahe start to increase. Um, we've done some evaluations of the fish that are on the lower end, and we're finding out that the, a lot of those fish are coming from our stockings. The stockings down there are working to increase abundance. But over time, we're starting to see upper Oahe this slow decline in abundance, okay? So it's not as drastic as it was on lower Lake Oahe, but the abundance in lower or in upper Lake Oahe continues to decline year after year. Condition. Again, we started stocking the shad. The smelt are recovering. Um, condition over the last five years, six years, actually looks acceptable. You know, I, I, it looks good for you know some of our larger fish. Again, 80 to 90 is what we want to see, and we're seeing generally most of these fish are staying between that 80 and 90 body condition over the last six years, um, and that's for both Upper Oahe and Lower Oahe. So there appears to be enough food in the system. We just got to get some more walleye into the system, and then H3. Again, that, that, that third metric, how long is a fish when it hits three years of age? And we haven't done that for 2022 yet because we haven't aged our fish from our, the nets we just ran in September. Um, but you see the same trend that from 2016 all the way up to 2020, it's increasing. Not as fast as we'd like it to increase, but it is increasing, okay? We are building that prey base out there. The fish are generally growing faster than they were when they hit that, that bottoming out point. So since 2017, again, walleye abundance improving, particularly on uh, Lower Oahe where we started the stockings, um, but they're continuing to decline on Upper Lake Oahe. They are just a slow decline year after year. Um, but on the flip side, condition is good, growth is good, so it creates a good system. We just have to get more fish into Upper Lake Oahe now. So again, plans going forward starting in 2023. <laughs> We're gonna start stocking more fish. Right now, our stocking plans for 2023 is 2.8 million walleye fingerlings for Upper Lake Oahe, mid and upper Lake Oahe. 
We're going to try to do about 400,000 fingerlings per location, and we're going to get seven different locations. Uh, Pollock, Indian Memorial, Wolf Bay, East Whitlock, Indian Creek, Swan Creek, and Sutton Bay. Again, trying to take all those fish and kind of spread them out across Upper Lake Milwaukee, mid and upper Lake Milwaukee. One thing we are bound, I don't know if you picked up on this, but to get our hauling trucks down to the lake, we have to have boat ramps. So there are some stretches there that, you know, we just can't physically get our two-ton hauling trucks down to the lake. Um, so there are some spots that we really like to stock, but just can't physically get them in there. And since we're adding, you know, one of the biggest stockings we've ever done, game, game fish and parks has ever done, we want to make sure there's food for them. So we're going to keep stocking gizzard shed um, and definitely try to focus on upper Lake Oahe. Again, if you remember those, those condition graphs, lower Lake Oahe, the condition's good. Um, upper Lake Oahe, condition of those fish is a little bit poorer. It's still good, don't get me wrong, they're still a healthy fish. Um, but we just want to make sure there's enough food out there when we put 2.8 million walleye out there, we don't want them to stop growing and we don't want them to be in poor condition. So we're just going to keep flooding it with gizzard shed. So next year, we're going to do four different locations, uh, Pollock, Indy Creek, Swan Creek, and East Whitlocks. 300 adults per location. And again, those adults as big females can put out almost half a million eggs. And these are all going to be the fish that uh, we collect from Lake Shark, so down on Hippo Lake. So this is our, our internal trap and transfer work. Can I ask a question? Sure. What is the su success ratio of those gizzard shad actually producing the fish? Very good. So once you put them in, the ones that survive, though, there's some nuances with shad. They don't haul very well. So we do lose quite a few shad. And if you see that in the springtime, you know, oftentimes you go to a boat ramp and there will be dead shad there. It's because we were just there stocking. That does happen. They're very finicky fish and we do lose some of our adults. The ones that survive do very well producing young fish. The only problem is, another problem with shad is that they die over the winter, like you wouldn't believe. And so, you know, we're, the idea is we keep putting shad in there and hope for a mild winter, um, but until we have that mild winter where they survive over, you know, for more than one year, we're just gonna keep putting shad into that system until we do have that, that mild winter, until they do survive. Why not smell? Excuse me? Why not smell? Smell would be tough for many different reasons. One of the primary ones is we have to find a clean source for them. Originally, we got smelt from the Great Lakes, and since then, there's been diseases and stuff in the Great Lakes that we can't get smelt from the Great Lakes anymore. North Dakota has abundance of smelt. North Dakota has abundance of smelt. The nice thing about shad is we can haul adult shad and let them spawn on their own. If we're stocking smelt, the only time we can get them is either right when they're spawning or after the spawn. And we're not going to produce the number of young fish that we can using gizzard shed. Does that make sense? We 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 need a lot more smell move compared to the number of shad. So this is our stockings. Now something that I'm pretty excited about is over the last couple months we've been working with our partners in Kansas, and they have a few lakes that are overrun with gizzard shad, and. We're working on doing some disease testing to make sure, again, before we bring anything in, we gotta make sure that they're disease-free, AIS-free, and all that stuff. But it sounds like these are some viable sources. And next year, Dan Mosier from Kansas Parks and Recreation and Jeff Cook is gonna help us get 4,500 total adults to move up to, to Lake Oahe. And keep in mind, this is three times the number we've done in the past. So a lot of shed in the system. Again, yeah, looking at six different locations, you know, from upper down to a mountain, <coughs> uh, Lake Oahe, and this will complement the stuff we're putting in there as well. So we're, the internals, trap and transfer will still take place. This will be additive to what, uh, what we're doing ourselves. So that's pretty much it. Quick summary. Walleye abundance is still low, and you know, we, we've heard that from everybody. We know it's out there, we're trying to stock. Um, but it's improving on Lower Oahe. Again, where we focus that sp that stocking effort on. Uh, condition is good. Growth is improving. Um, and the plan next year is, again, one of our biggest stockings we've done, 2.8 million and 1,200 pre-spawn adults, uh, gizzard shed, and 4,500, hopefully, that come from Kansas. That is it for the presentation. Questions. Plenty of time for questions. That's why we're here. Yeah? When are you going to address the pressure? 
that's brought on by all these tournaments that are going on. I could call it. They probably take a ton of fish out of there. And the people that pull the most fish out aren't sportsmen in Lake Hawaii. They come from other places with a boat that's worth $150,000. I can't compete with that on my level. When are you going to stop them? What happened in Minnesota, in like Lake Malax? They come here to fish because they got fished out with tournaments. On them. So, Think about that. Yep. So tournaments, you know, we, we've done some looking into tournaments. We know everybody that runs a tournament, they have to have a tournament permit. We know how many boats are running, how many fish they're getting. And compared to the, the majority of our the average anglers that are out there, tournaments is actually a very small component. <coughs> with that being said, we did have a lot of complaints this year about uh, that last tournament with guys that were deep fishing, looking for big fish, and releasing a lot of uh, de uh, releasing a lot of big fish that were came out of deep water. So anytime you pull those walleye out of greater than about 35 feet, you know a lot of those fish go belly up. And that, that's something that we've talked about, and we haven't made a decision yet for that, but that's something that we're bringing up in the future years. But as far as straight numbers, tournaments actually harvest very few fish compared to, you know, go look at Bush's Landing on a Saturday, you know, just general anglers, and it blows the tournaments out of the water. The tournaments not, aren't really the culprit. It's just a lot of fish. It's pressure on you. It's pressure, yeah. All the lake and water sucked all year long. All year long, we were catching fish. Yep. Most of us quit fishing. Yep. yep, the abundance is going down. We need to get more fish in there. Yep. Part of the concern probably would be if you're fishing a tournament right now, you're trying to get two bites a day because mm -hmm. you can't catch 16 to 18 inches. So all of those big fish are being targeted. Yep. What's your percentage of, uh, of fishermen targeting salmon? And the percentage of the dollars that you're spending to continually stock and kill, because I've witnessed it four times, so they drive away and they're all dead. Um, what's the percentage of the so, dollars versus the fishing? I couldn't tell you about the dollars, but I could tell you how many people are targeting them. So that goes up and down based on how good the salmon fishing is. In a four year, we're down to about two or three percent of the anglers are targeting salmon, maybe a okay, few less. So like, 3% of the anglers are targeting salmon. What percentage of the dollars of the game fishing parks hot is going to that 3% versus the walleye? Probably less than walleye, so. Well, it should be less than walleye. 97% no. of the fishermen are walleye. Well, the, so like Blue Dog Fish Hatchery, you know, that's a hatchery that for the last 20 years has only produced walleye. It has one of our biggest staffs, it has our, you know, our biggest grounds for upkeep, it has all the ponds and stuff like that. So it's a it's a big expense. You know, blue dog fish hatchery for walleye is a big expense. Versus the salmon, trout, stuff like that that we do out in those western hatcheries is actually a, a much smaller component of their overall hatchery budget. But you're not answering my question, what percentage of dollars are spent? That that I don't you'd have to ask for our hatchery. I mean, it, it just seems to me I live at Whitlock and you're spending way too much money for three percent of the fishermen. If it's that, I don't believe it's that because I don't know anybody that targets them other than from shore once in a while in the fall and the circus that goes around the turbines at the dam. But just say you're three percent, you got ninety seven percent of the fishermen, probably almost everybody in this room, mm -hmm. targeting walleyes, that ought to be ninety seven percent of your budget. I, I can't. Bet it isn't. I can't answer. I don't know. I don't know what it is, unless John, if you know what we spend. But I, I do not know. Okay. Um, on salmon and, and walleyes and all that, um, I'd have to go and dig in to get the numbers. But yeah, I, you know, I'm a little sensitive to it because mm -hmm. I've I've witnessed four stockings, and they all die. Thousands of them. Of the salmon. Of the salmon. So. What's the point? Put the money in the walleye. I can, I can certainly tell you that how we manage walleye in Oahe is not restricted by anything we do for salmon. They're two completely different sets of But resources. you only got so much money. So let's put it where the fishing are. Uh, how long will it take to get a viable desert shad population 
for forage. So because the first year you're just going to have these little bitty things. So shad actually grow very fast. So they will. But if they die in the winter. So even in that first year, so by the fall, you'll have shad that are six, seven inches. The nice thing about shad is they spawn right when you put them in. You know, these fish are almost releasing eggs. They'll spawn once, but then they keep spawning over the duration of the summertime. So that's why in the fall, you'll see shad that are that big. You know, she's shad that are that big. You put these fish in and they keep spawning and keep spawning and keep making babies, right? It's a, it's a food resource that it just replenishes itself. The problem that you hit on it is overwinter survival. It doesn't matter how many fish we put in there that first fall, if none of them survive that next year, you gotta do it again and you keep doing it. But if you look at the last time we were in our drought, Gizzard Chad got in through uh, Shade, uh, Angostura, Shade Hill, some of those other reservoirs, and we didn't stock them and they right. took off. We had those mild winters and there was shad in everywhere. And a lot of anglers didn't like it because it was so hard to catch the fish because they were so full of shad. But it's but, kind of a boom or bust thing then. Well, it's, it's boom or bust. The, the biggest thing is you have to stay on top of it and you have to be monitoring it because as soon as they're gone, they're gone. You there, is, there isn't any other forage bases that would work? Well, well no. I, I've got a question for you, Mark. If those shad do take off, which we hope they do, is that going to help the pop population of the rainbow smelt because it'll maybe take a little less pressure? Is, Most is definitely. That true? And then also those dumb uh, whatever you got out deep, uh, no, the lake herring. Uh -huh. Yeah. Stingous. Hopefully these fish get acclimated to a, a shallow bait fish so they don't stay in that 50 foot of water and we don't have to kill them all every time we're trying to catch them. That, that's one of the hardest things with the water levels dropping is that your cold water is you're losing your cold water on Upper Lake Oahe, right? As that water comes down, cold water is pretty much restricted to the 212 bridge and a little bit further up. But as that water drops, that cold water habitat where the smelt live, it's all going to be moving, all those smelt are going to be moving downstream. Okay, They have to be in cold water. They have to be in deep cold water. The nice thing about shad is that when you put them in, shad are up shallow, they're in warm water. They keep the fish attainable to our anglers for a longer period of time. Five to ten years ago, they kept the Moro River alive because of the, the shad and the Yep. And the drum and all that stuff up there. Yep. So even if we put, you know, you brought up the idea of putting more smelt up there in the system, if that water levels keep going down, whether we put 100 million or 200 million in there, they're still going to be restricted to that lower end. We need food up here that will keep the walleye condition good and growth good on Upper Lake Hawaii. Yeah. You touched on a little bit about the water fluctuations. How much? What kind of pressure does water fluctuation put on your stock campers? Release of, the different of our stocking? Well, you're stocking and your fish growth and stuff. How much do you lose? Going, going through the dam, you mean? Um, not as much as you would think. So, Hawaii has a kind of a unique dam that it's a it's a mid-column release. So, those fish have to be suspended depending on where the water elevation is. Those fish have to be suspended anywhere from 50 to 40 <coughs> feet down, depending on water elevation. So largely, why he doesn't lose, they lose some, but they don't lose a lot of our, our walleye through the turbines in a normal year. Again, we haven't had any of those, those big flushes. I think 2019 was one of our, our higher discharge years, but usually we don't lose a lot of walleye through the system. What we lose is our rainbow smell because they're in that cold water, and that's where the, like the 2011 was so problematic, we had a lot of walleye in the system, and in a month or two, there was nothing for them to eat. Because the smell came through, most of the walleye stayed, and they just they essentially starved to death. Yeah. How many fisheries do we have on Lake Oahe? How many fisheries? Yes. Um, Ten years ago, Six. we used to milk the females and so forth and so on. What do, whatever happened to that program? You mean spawning operations? Right. So right now we, we're just wanting to run one. This last year we ran one spawning operation out of the Grand River. Um, we used to run a spawning operation in the Cheyenne, and that was shut down um, many years ago. Many, many years ago for various why reasons. Why is that? So the Cheyenne River one was shut. No, why aren't we having more fisheries on Lake Hawaii, especially <coughs> the, uh, right up the southern part? Of the Lake Hawaii. Because we we collect plenty of eggs that we need. So with the Northeast going and Southeast going, 
Eggs are never a problem for us for collecting enough eggs. There's only been a handful of years where we didn't get enough eggs to fill our hatcheries. Does that make sense? We could have two it or three more spawns. Why, evidently, your numbers of spawning and the amount that you put into Lake Milwaukee are not meeting the needs of the fishermen. Why aren't they increasing? Well, we're starting stocking on lower Lake Oahe and we're seeing the abundances come up, we have to start that on upper Lake Oahe right now. What do you call acceptable when you say it's acceptable? Well, I'd like to put 20 times what we do in there, but you know, we can't do something like All right, that. Can I answer the question? Are you, sure, I, I don't know if I'm getting so, it. Uh, what, I think what you're asking is, why aren't they spawning more on Lake Oahe, right? The, 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 the hatcheries that they have, he, he alluded to it, but I don't know if he actually asked your question. So there's only enough resources those hatcheries can actually hold. And he said we get plenty of eggs to fill up those hatcheries. They can't hold any more in the facilities we currently have. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, so our, our hatcheries are usually full. Like, we're never egg limited. Very rarely are we egg limited. Well, why don't we have yeah. more hatcheries? Yeah. Is, there, is, there, yeah. is, there, is there are more hatcheries in the works? Are we looking at larger hatcheries? Down yes. The road? Yes, we are. Um, okay. It's something that we've been trying to work over the last two years, I believe. Um, but we, there are plans for at least one, if not two more hatcheries going in over the next five years, four years. I, I don't know. Yeah. It, yeah, and where are you looking at these? We're John? John? Well, hatcheries, we have a couple things. Right now we're looking at for locations for them. With the new hatcheries that we're looking at, they don't use a lot of ponds, unlike we have a blue dog. They raise the fish inside a building and they recirculate the water. So we aren't as unlimited in the places that we're able to put them. So we've been talking with South Dakota State University as an example. We have some facilities up and down on the Missouri River system where we already have staff. We're gonna look and see what would be the most cost effective to put those resources on the ground. And and then ideally, if there's a way to partner with SDSU on it, and that certainly would be beneficial too. Uh, we also are um, out at Cleggord and Rapid City. Uh, we're starting to raise some fish out there in those uh, recirculating tanks. That's the place right now they're learning how to raise walleyes in recirculation. So we're able to take that technology and apply it after we get out into new production facilities. So if you decide to put a new spawning station in at Moldridge, just for an example, how long would it be before it's built up and running and produced? <coughs> you mean a hatchery? Yeah, a hatchery. I'm a hatchery. Because there's, uh, we have had spawning stations in the past, yeah. but, uh, like on the Grand and the Cheyenne River. A new hatchery, it would be, uh, my bet, uh, wherever we would put one would be five years or so, just for all the the steps that go into it for the engineering, the prep, the budgeting, that kind of thing. How about the facility at, at Whitlock, the salmon station, it has the holding tanks, the pumps, the tank, can they increase that to, so you could use that at a time or is it not um, feasible? I, I'm just saying you've got tanks and pumps and, and holding. The walleyes in there instead of salmon? Yeah, forget that 3%. Go for the 97%. <laughs> I, I, you know, I know we have used it in the spring in the past. A possibility. We have I used it in the spring in the past. It would be it need to be a lot of retrofitting just for the uh, type of systems you need. The raceways in there are probably too big. Uh, we probably have to do a lot of things to it in order to change it to be a walleye facility. It'd be easier to build one of those newer recirculating ones than to retrofit with locks to raise walleyes. Honestly, so these RAS systems, it's a metal, it's a metal building. You know, it's a 40 by 100 metal building is all it is. Gravel floor, tanks inside it, and a bunch of equipment to like John was alluding to, recirculate that water, aerate the water, take out the ammonia, you know, a bunch of equipment in it. So they're actually, you know, they're, I don't want to say big facilities, but compared to Blue Dog, much smaller fingerprint, but can produce a lot of fish in these, these areas. So something like Whitlock's is probably too small. We'd have to go in anyway and retrofit, you know, build onto that. Um, the other thing is wherever we put these, we have to have people to actually 
run them and stuff like that. We don't have an office in Whitlocks. We do have some great park staff, but I don't know if I can ask them to raise fish for <laughs> six weeks, eight weeks out of here. Yeah. How is it? Francis Case and Shark can keep producing desirable fish year after year after year after year with tons and tons of pressure, and we're up here singing the blues. Stocking efforts? They don't stock down there. It's gizzard check. You know, I should put up their fish. You know, if it takes, if a fish is only hitting four. Don't no fish stock in either one of those reservoirs? I'm not believing Shark and Francis Case? Mm -hmm. No, there is not. Lewis and Clark does do walleye stockings, but other than that, they are a gizzard shad based system so there i put up the the growth like lewis and clark they're hitting 17 inches in three years well it's taken us a year longer if not more to hit that to hit that 17 inch mark so those fish from hatching out to get to a size attainable or desirable by our anglers takes it's so much quicker that 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 fishery just turns over you can harvest and harvest and harvest those fish spawn grow and they're in our in the hands of the anglers for lake Owaki, when that that initial growth is slow, it just takes longer to get there. You know, that, that's the big difference between Sharp, Francis Case, and then Lake Oahe. They have gizzard shad, and gizzard shad, they have small walleye. Gizzard shad produce walleye up to about 16, 17 inches really quick. Good thing. How does, how does their water fluctuations compare to ours? Like as far as bait fish and us spawning? So, so I mean like the forest fluctuations on us, like shit could be spawning up shallow and we're just toast because they dropped it. Eggs are up dry. Yep. So they, they pretty much stay. Sharp is, it changes a couple feet a year maybe. Francis Case, they do have a drawdown, but it's in the fall. And then in the springtime, they raise it back up. They call it their fall drawdown. And so when you look at Oahe, you know, in the springtime, the last few years, a lot of times our water is actually coming down and you're right. It, you know, dries out eggs and it's, it's terrible for every fish that's up there spawning. Compare that to Sharp and Francis Case, which is relatively stable year to year. Yeah. Uh, are you going to do anything with the slot limit change, uh, possession limit? Anything going to happen there? Not at this time. I mean, the, the big thing we hear is that people can't find those fish that are 15 to 20 inches right now. So even if we enacted a regulation, how many fish would it actually save? Let's get some fish in the system before we start talking about regulating. You don't think it would save some of the that are <coughs> Say what? I realize they're really low and you only have a certain amount of them, and it takes, what, three years for a male walleye to be able to spawn five for a female? That's you don't group. think that changing that slot limit could save some of those fish? I'm not saying they'll all get caught and die, but it's worth a shot. It will save some fish, hands down, it will save some fish, but will have a meaningful effect on the fishery up here. How and about it, working with North Dakota for them to put the damn slot limit on? We had high water, Spring of the year, they were taking all our spawning fish out up there. Good. Uh, just a question: uh, What exactly are you talking about by a slot limit? Like what we have well, on North Dakota on Lake Hawaii, you don't have a slot limit. No, but on the North Dakota side. So down like here we three, have three, one over. We had high water. Yeah. Those guys are catching limits of 24, 25. Well, the Hazelton on the spring and what spawning what fish. We're all getting shot <laughs> out up there. You're pitching Jason, you every fish you're catching is 23 or 24 so by inches. A, by a slot limit, though, uh, there you're talking about the one over 20 we have in place here. Yeah, okay. North Dakota okay. doesn't have one, but when our water was high during the spring of the year, all, the, all these big primary spawning females were getting caught and killed up there. That's very true. Does North Dakota stock in Lake Wahi? No, they do not. They stock Skakawea, and they don't stock Lake Wahi. So they just rely on us? The, Historically, majority of the walleye produced in this area actually comes from North Dakota. So Beaver Bay is probably one of the most important walleye producing locations on this lake when the lake is high. Now that the water is dropping, fewer and fewer fish are going to be coming out of North Dakota because the Beaver Bays of the world are now starting to get cut off. You know, they're not going to be that good nursery habitat, not the good spawning habitat. So now it's up to us in North in South Dakota to start producing our own fish in Upper Lake Hawaii. Yeah. Speaking to that, when Hawaii dropped here in June, then the water started to come back back up in July. We got what two foot of water maybe that came up. Sakakawea, from what I heard from fishermen up there, was up 10, 12, 13 feet. Why wasn't more of that water released? 
That would be a question for the Corps of Engineers. Yeah. That, that's one way around. Okay, well, if we're dropping two more feet by the end of October. About three feet. Yeah. So the, the plan, again, this is the Corps' plan for the rest of October. I believe they're planning on Oahe dropping another two feet. Now, that sounds terrible, but one thing to keep in mind is that low water elevation down the road is actually a very good thing. We drop the, drop the lake, we start vegetating the shorelines. Everybody can remember after the 2009, water came up and there were fish everywhere, right? We had nursery habitat, we had productivity was through the roof, and so an idea that we just have a barren shoreline with mud on it and the water doesn't go up and down, that's not what we want. We need the water to come down, vegetate the shoreline, so when it does come back up, we have very abundant year classes that come out of that. 2009 year class is probably the biggest year class we've seen on Lake Oahe, and that's because the water flooded that vegetation and instantly we had fish everywhere. So it's, it's again, dropping water, you know, in, in the moment it's not a good thing, but looking down the road, two to three, when the water does come back up, it will be a very good thing. So who, who is it that calls North Dakota and says, hey, we hear you guys got a call for the water. Why aren't you letting us have some? Who makes that call? The governor? No. The Omaha district. The Corps of Engineers. Somebody's got to complain to get anything done. Yeah. 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 Well, they do. It's called the barges. <laughs> How does that work? It's pretty <laughs> much all decided by <laughs> the yeah. yeah. Corps Master yeah. Manual yeah. for how they operate things. Yeah. Not a lot has unchanged for priorities or the times of the year when water is released for certain purposes. Uh, my bet is that if there was a bunch of water that, that came into Sakakawea, it was a, a within the, uh, the plans they had in place. Eventually that would be a, a move into Hawaii and downstream for downstream purposes, but they didn't have it in their plan for some reason to raise Hawaii up. Can I simplify something for the Corps of Engineers, for these people that don't understand the Corps of Engineers? You may I've, certainly try. I've to dealt with them <laughs> for years in bass tournaments on both the Mississippi, the Columbia, and and uh, Hawaii, or, uh, 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 Lewis and Clark. You can't talk fishing with the Corps of Engineers. They're going to do what they want to do. They'll drop the water or raise the water when they want to. And there isn't a fisherman in the world that's going to change their minds. They have their program, and they're going to stick to their I think program. the original Pink Sloan Act didn't deal with sport fishing or hunting or anything. Well, and, and you know, we, we shouldn't be relying it's on... It's navigation with, for them. You know, even when we talk about the core, we're still relying on snowpack in the mountains. So if there's no snow up there, it doesn't matter what the core wants to do, we won't get any water. That's why we have to approach it by doing our own stocking, getting our own fish out there because we can't rely, we can't assume there's going to be even water coming down the river next year. This year on, um, you know, up north in Skakawea, that was the Yellowstone flood, right? The Yellowstone River flood. How do you predict that? You can't. So we cannot go into this thinking or hoping that next year we're going to have good water and it'll be the, you know, it'll be the, the save all. We have to do it ourselves and start, start stocking. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the number of walleyes going down, we don't have the numbers. Has there been any talk about changing the daily limit or possession limit or so forth and so on? We haven't talked about that yet. Large part is because as the walleye numbers go down, fishing gets tougher. Fewer and fewer people are fishing, you know, upper Lake Oahe. Right? So when you look back when numbers were high, we had a lot more people fishing. So the, the number of anglers pretty much mirrors catch rates and abundance of walleye. So if we are retroactive and put on a regulation now, it's only going to impact a very handful of people that are still out there fishing. Okay? And again, these fish can turn it on and come back very quickly, and it's very hard to take a regulation off the books once it's already on there. Well, North Dakota's got, got five fish in my No, 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 no one's 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 and they do so much better than we. What the heck is going on here? I don't think to be. So, you know what? I know what they look like. They're like this. They are. So oh, they're, they're big. They're fat. They're the big difference. And there's puke and smell them. Garrison Dam. <clears throat> this is the, the, the biggest difference between Lake Oahe and Garrison Dam is they don't lose the smell when there's a flood. 
they have overflow gates that the majority of the water, when there's a flood, is the warm water at the surface. So their smelt never come through the system. Lake Oahe, when we flood, we flush out the bottom of the lake and we get rid of all of our smelt. So after the 2011 flood, Skakwea was still sitting in really good shape. They had all their smelt up there because they let loose the top, you know, a few feet of water, that warm water, and they kept all their smelt. Oahe, I don't know who decided to build it the way they did, but every time there's high water, it comes out the bottom and it takes the smelt with them. Yeah? So you take our eggs from the ground, you take from the blue dog, yep. and you go plummet down the lower, lower lake, Oahe. Why don't you take their eggs, take them to the blue dog, and put up here instead of taking our eggs? Or it doesn't have to do any. So, so we don't take eggs out of the lower lake, Oahe. Uh, no, there used to be up here right now, right? Yep. yep. We used to take them out of Cheyenne River, which was on lower Lake Oahe, mm -hmm. but there was actually problems with the egg quality down there is poor, and they've done strontium and selenium and all these studies to look at why that was. But there's something that's going on coming down the Cheyenne River. For a long time, we thought it might have been mining issues in the Black Hills coming down Cheyenne River, but the, the egg quality from like the Cheyenne River, it, it's poor. And so we can't. You know, if we relied on Cheyenne River to produce the eggs for us, we wouldn't have very many eggs. Most of them just don't survive. Is the natural reproduction gone down too, or how is that going? Yep, natural reproduction has been low. Oh, you know, especially we started stocking again in 2017, and we didn't see a lot of evidence of natural reproduction from 2012 through 2017. What's happening there? Any idea? Probably dropping lake elevation, that's a big part of it. Again, having the, the food for the young fish is part of it. Productivity is probably going down with the dropping lake elevations. It's a suite of things. If you could just <coughs> uh, you know, the, the shining star and say, this is what it is, a lot of people would give you a lot of money, but it's everything all combined. There's a lot of things working against them right now. Yeah, yeah you know, you're kind of putting all your eggs in one basket with the gizzard shed. On Lake Sharp, they see a lot less ice than us, I'm sure. Is that the reason they have better survival, that we have thicker ice and higher mortality rate on the... They have underwater springs. They have seeps, warm water springs down there. So like Hippo Lake and, or Hippo Lake's and Oxbow Lake of Lake Sharp, just a backwater area. And there's areas that can stay open because the <coughs> water's coming up through the bottom of the lake. Um, and there's multiple of them on Lake Sharp, same thing with Francis Case. So their shad, they might be spread out all over Lake Sharp throughout the year, but in the winter time, they go to those warm water seeps over winter, spread back out the following year and keep spawning. But with us, the mortality rate's gonna be probably extremely high most years. Most years, yeah. Could we incorporate stock and smelt to it at the same time? That's gonna be a permanent base, or is that the same thing they're gonna go down with the cold water? We can stock as many smelt as we want, but again, the majority of the cold water in Lake Oahe is south of you guys. And we want to keep you know, those fish shallow, you know, for <coughs> the majority of us to go and catch them. We, I, you know, we don't want to see a lot of people fishing deep. We want to keep them shallow, and we want to keep them up up here. Does that make sense? Upper Lake Oahe. Say what? In the 80s, the smelt were abundant. Yeah. Why would that change? It depends on the time of year. So in the springtime, the smelt, the water is cold everywhere, right? So the smelt can run anywhere. So people talk about dipping, dipping smelt, catching smelt. But the problem is, is when that water heats up, they have to follow that cold water. And so if the water is low and, you know, we might only have 40 feet of water out here by the bridges or 60 feet, whatever it is, those fish are getting tucked into that cold water at, you know, as deep as they can go. Problem is, a lot of those fish either die, they get trapped in warm water and die, or they move down to where there is cold water. Do you have an idea of what the population of the rainbow smelt is down south? Is it increasing? It, it's, it is increasing. Uh, it's not increasing fast, but it is increasing. Same thing with Cisco. So we have what we would call a recovering smelt biomass right now and a recovering Cisco. Um, Cisco are a little bit different. They're not bound to that cold water like rainbow smelt are. That's probably why you see the Cisco up here, just like you, you do gizzard shed and stuff like that. The smelt have to be in cold water. Cisco don't. Yes, but again, that's another great question because, you know, if we put, if the smelt numbers start coming way up, again, with the way our lake elevation is, we're not going to see a lot of smelt up in this area. So does Cisco 
basically just grow too fast for the little walleyes to feed on? So the Cisco grow fairly fast, but over the last few years, their growth has actually slowed down. So Cisco were actually so abundant that we saw condition decline and the growth of the Cisco is actually declining because there's so many out there. Now, a Cisco kit is available to a walleye, a young walleye, up through their first year, I would say. But then after that, the only, the only walleye that can take advantage of a Cisco are your, your big walleye. That's why your big walleye are looking so good. You know, your big walleye are super fat, and that's because they're all eating Cisco. Now, they just don't have the, the small Cisco out there for them to... Did them you guys stock the Cisco? We stocked Cisco. We used to call them Lake Herring, but they're actually a Cisco. They stocked them back in the 80s, and we have not stocked them since then. This was all natural. And believe it or not, up until about 2012, we rarely ever saw them. So, you know, Fort Peck is 100% Cisco driven. Skakawea is 100% smelt driven. And for some reason, we were smelt up until about 2012. And then it flip-flopped, and we had Cisco reproduction from 12 to about 15. And, you know, the smelt were gone at that point and building back up. Yeah? Has anybody done a study? They study the effect of the dollars spent by fishermen as opposed to your revenue that you spend every year and see if there is a correlation. You know, in other words, you said there's a handful of fishermen now fishing compared to what there was. What if we could, what would the dollar effect to try to increase your budget by increasing the number of fishermen? Absolutely. They and already so have those models out there. You get enough money to build the hatchery you need to increase the... So they do this and they do it statewide and they do it across the nation. So every angler trip, I want to say it's $140 on average is what an angler trip is. So we can just adjust that to how many angler trips we have on Upper Hawaii. We can say that it's dropped this much revenue for the state, for local economies and stuff like that. Yep. That's something that we used to put in our, our reports every year actually is the economic impact of the fishery. But yes, we look do have that. Yeah. What is the state doing with the tagging program? Yeah. 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 What are you doing with the tagging program as far as tagging? We used to catch yeah. tag ones. I haven't caught a tag one in three years probably. So that, the, the, here, the gentleman was asking about the tagging program that we had, the, the jaw tags, I assume. So that was a study we did. We started it back in 2012, and that's really the basis for, you know, the what we were looking at is the impacts of the flood. So when I talk about mortality and stuff like that, that was a way to show us how those fish were responding to 2011 flood. It also set up how we manage the fishery. So the reason why you split it into two, I don't know if you guys used to remember, but we used to have three zones on Lake Oahe. Um, it was just a little more convoluted, but this study actually helped us develop our management zones and our plans going forward as far as stocking and stuff like that. And we have not tagged since Oh, 2017, I think. So we, we finished that, and that's when we, that kind of fed us into the stocking program and how we went forward with managing. How much concern is there about the, the competition? So finicky oh, oh. and so sensitive to water temperatures, isn't there a better option for something that's a little hardier that can be introduced at the same time? Like, I don't know, what about shiners or something like that? Probably. I mean, it seems like you're just hoping for a good winter and it's kind of rare. Exactly. The, the problem is anytime you put something in there, we're, we're, we're going to put it adults because we have to get millions of offspring, right? So we can't truck over millions of fish, you know, at, at least eatable size fish. And so then you're starting to look at perch maybe, but again, perch, you need specific requirements for a perch to spawn, right? They hang their skeins on vegetation. If we put five million perch out there right now, there's no flooded vegetation, we won't get them to spawn, you know, we're, we're, we'll be the same as we are right now. <coughs> You're right there, I guess, I, I don't know. As far as I know, the best option that we see is always gizzard chad. We've gone through, so Nebraska stocks, or stocked uh, uh, alewives, and talking to those people, you know, they probably wouldn't do it again if they, they had their druthers. There's some issues with alewives eating larval, supposedly eating larval walleye, and depressing populations, um, it's a good food resource, but do we want another predator out there eating our young walleye? And I would say no. Um, and, and so there are other options. Other states have looked at other options, but 
the best thing we have seen, the safest thing, and the most productive is gizzard shed in our mind. At least until, again, smelt, again, it's rebounding, but for up here, gizzard shed is very important. Is there any concern about the, the other fish that are in the river? Or, hold on one second, yeah? yeah. There, the walleye is not the only fish in the river. Okay. What about the competition fish? What, is there anything being done to try to control? I mean, the catfish are. Anybody in here not <laughs> caught a catfish this last year? Yep. And, and, and the catfish aren't big. I mean, they're they're baby catfish. So well, they, there's got to be a. Is there any commercial fish? Have, every fish out there will eat another fish at some point. Yeah. Um, catfish population is is robust. It's doing strong, but. Um, short of a tail bounty, which I don't think we'll do, and it would cost way more money that we could be putting into producing fish. You know, we encourage our anglers to catch and harvest our catfish as much as we can. We just don't have a. There's a reason why everybody here is interested in walleye, yeah. not and not catfish, right? But if the catfish take it over, you're not going to have any walleye to catch. I, I understand, but you know, we can't convince people to take take them out to harvest them. Bring up the boys from Arkansas. Okay. Gizzard shad are planktivores for the most of their life, and then they switch to it's called detritivory. They actually eat like benthic algae and stuff like that. So they're eating phytoplankton, zooplankton, and then algae off the bottom, um, fungus, stuff like that. They take in sediment, digest what they can, and you know, pass the rest. Why? Why? They, they don't. They're completely phytoplankton, zooplankton, and detract, you know, detractivorous. Um, you know, that's another thing with smelt we always talk about, too. You know, smelt have been accused of consuming larval walleye at certain times, too. Again, I, not a lot of evidence of that, but they have showed some studies where smelt will actually eat larval walleye. You know, the smelt are in shallow in the springtime, walleye are spotted, walleye hatch out, and sometimes smelt can eat walleye. Again, going back to the, the gizzard shad, you know, the, the risk of gizzard shad influencing negatively, you know, walleye is very, very low. Two or three weeks ago, I, by the time we went off the boats, there was a fresh hatch of gizzard, gizzard shad swimming all over up the Morro River. The little inch long things just Everywhere. all over the place. And those fish moved up in seven feet of water because of it. Yep. I mean, they were, they, the fish will find whatever they have to, to eat. Yep. If we can keep them now, keep them shallow. You know, but keep them up that goes to your gizzard channel spawn two or three times a year. This was three weeks or a month ago when they spawned, so yep. that's kind of nice. As long as the water temp's above 65-ish, they'll they'll just keep going. Yeah. Since the big flood, how much silting and shoreline erosion? I, I couldn't tell you a lot. Um, you know, anytime the water drops, you're silting in the the sediments below that that water's edge. As far as number, we don't do any studies with sedimentation or impactedness so you know when the water's high your wave action will clean the rock that's why you see this you know a nice looking rock line as the water comes down all of a sudden that rock line there's a lot of silt it's called embeddedness uh, anytime that water drops you're having more embeddedness you know that that spawning habitat is reduced until wind and wave action can once again clean all that rock off clean that silt off in that you know top three to six feet where those fish are spawning yeah. Uh, I keep hearing rumors about zebra mussels. Is that are they in here? No, not officially. They are not. <laughs> we have not found any. GFMP has not confirmed any. Um, we have, we have not found any mussels in Lake Oahe, as far as we know. Do <coughs> you guys have any um, conversations with the core? Like, if you guys have issues with, like during the spawn in the spring. Does the core ever hold the water or raise it during? I mean, can you guys have conversations with them about the fishery at all? Or are they not listening to anybody? There's a small amount that they can do, all depending on the year. Um, with the four big reservoirs, Paxacacawea, I'm sorry, the big three, Paxacacawea and Oahe. And one year they favor a wahi and back the rising water if they have the water. The other alternate year it would be Sakakawea they favor. So um, typically in a period of drought like this, the best is, that we can hope for is to stay level during the spawn. If we let them know when the spawn will be, there may be enough water down in case that they can use that water and see if they can hold a wahi level. But that's a trade-off there too because 
there's a fishery in Francis Case. But there have been years we have talked with them and they've done their best to keep it stable or rising, especially years when we thought it was very important for smelt to spawn in the past and we were focused on a, a few inches of rise to help with that. So there's a little bit we can do, but it's still gotta be within the big picture of the corn. Sure. Any other questions? Mark, are the plans that you thrown out for the stocking of the walleye and the gizzard chat, is that, that's not gonna stop in 2023, is it? I mean, your plans are to keep? Plans are to keep going. So as of right now, the one thing that I should point out is that we're doing a, a big stocking. And one thing we don't want to do is stock multiple year classes on top of each other. So we don't want to say 2.8 million this year, 2.8 million next year, 2.8 million another year. Um, and that the big thing there is growth and condition. We don't want to keep pumping walleye in the system if we're going to see declines in growth and condition. We want these fish to grow as fast as possible to hit 15 inches to be harvested, right? So the plan right now tentatively in 2023 is a big stocking focused on Upper Lake Oahe. Uh, 2024, we're going to do a, a smaller stocking, somewhere around a million, I'm guessing. And then 2025, come back with another big stocking. 2026, again, reduce it down and do that alternating years every two or three years. Do really big stocks. But the Gizzard Chad, you're going to keep? Gizzard Chad, yeah, Gizzard Chad will keep putting out there. Again, they're not, um, you know, you don't see that same abundance to growth issues that we see with Wally. You put a lot of Shad out there and they're still going to grow fine. Freshwater shrimp, or do we have those? This doesn't do much here. But yeah, we, we see them. They just their their numbers are just too low. I think there's just too many mouths out there, and you just don't see high abundances of them. Yeah. What's your survival rate on stocking fish? Oh, uh, as far as a number, I could not tell you uh, of the fish that we stock. I could not tell you the numbers that we see. The one thing we've done with walleye on the lower end is we can go in and say, of a year class, so 2018 we stocked a lot of fish. We can go back a couple years later, grab a bunch of fish from down there and say, what percentage of the population down here did we stock? What percentage was produced naturally? And we did that for that 2018 year class, so that big one that we stocked, two million, and like 50% of the fish, you know, like, I think it was like 48% of the fish, almost 50% of the fish were stocked fish. So, you know, if we wouldn't have stocked, there would have been half as many fish in Lake Wahi. But that's all ratios. I couldn't tell you a number of, of those two million. Was it a million? Was it 1.5? I couldn't tell you. All I can say is that 50% of the fish that were out there was, came, originated from our stockings. Fish migration. Yeah. How far do they migrate? Um, and how do you know? <clears throat> That only from fishing catching the tag fish? Uh, the tagging, we did a lot of movement studies with tagging, and Brent brought up a good point. The, the system was very different from 2012 to 2016. We were, we were doing that jaw tagging. Back then, fish were not moving very far. On average, you know, like 20 miles or less. But we have a very different system now, and hopefully in the future we'll have a very different system. And, you know, the type of prey, you know, where they have to go to find prey, where the cold water habitat is, all that stuff water dictates elevation. how water elevation, all dictates how those fish move. Does that make sense? Now we've done some telemetry studies on Lake Sharp. Um, so these are the ones that have the acoustic tags. They actually emit a, a sound and we have receivers everywhere. So we actually see how those fish move. And in Lake Sharp, we have fish that are moving essentially dam to dam in a year. So big, big movement, big migrations for Lake Sharp. We don't have that information for Lake Oahe, but walk, walleye are capable of making big movements. They just didn't when we were doing the tagging. You know, at the time of the tagging, the fish really weren't moving all that much. I caught one of your hundred dollar ones at West, at West Whitlock that was tagged at Beaver Bay. Mm -hmm. our, our biggest movement was from below Riverdale, or uh, below uh, Garrison Dam, you know, right below uh, Scott Cuyo. It actually moved through Oahe Dam. It was caught on the lower end of Lake Sharp. That was the furthest one. But that's an oddity. That, that you know, when you look at thousands and thousands of fish records, you know, we're looking at the average. <laughs> Getting back to your hatcheries. The uh, since Blue Dog has been has zebra mussels in it, is that a threat of not having any walleyes to stock? We still have a plan going forward with those. They, there's a, a chemical treatment you can add called the Edwards Protocol. Um, it's a chemicals in a process that you add to the water that kills 
uh, zebra mussel villagers. Um, so we'll be doing that with all of our stockings next year. On top of that, we're going to be using certain protocols in the hatchery to try to keep, you know, villagers. So we're rinsing the fish. You know, we're using nets. We're not dumping water into the tank. So we'll use like chlorinate, uh, dechlorinated well water to haul the fish. So we'll net, net them out again. We'll do everything to minimize that risk. And then the last thing we'll do is put in that chemical treatment to kill the villagers. That's one of the nice things about the RAS systems is that you know you're very biosecure. You know, a RAS system, if you do get something in there, you drain everything, let it sit a while, everything's dead, you just start right start again. But that is a, a very good concern. Yeah. So like our other species of fish like northern pike and silver bass and smallmouth bass, are they just like maintaining like are they naturally spawning in here? Because I think so few of them get taken out by anglers that, you know, like northern pike, which are a huge predator fish, but I don't know if a lot of people keep them. I'm sure there are some that mm -hmm. do. But so do they spawn? Is that what's keeping them sustainable as their own? Yep, we don't we don't stock any of the other the, the only two fish that you know, the warm water fish that we stocked recently has been walleye and gizzard shed. The the white bass, crappie, you know. Uh, yellow perch, all those, that's all natural. Uh, in some years, you can have really good reproduction. Again, that 2009 year class of crappie, if you guys remember like 2012, 2013, those, those big crappie, that was all natural. That happened, again, when the, the water, lake elevation came up, flooded that vegetation, you had nursery habitat, and fish just, all fish did, did well. Okay. But yeah, that's all, that's all natural. We, we don't do any of that. Yeah, Bill. Oh, sorry. You're going to put your presentation on your website? Yes. Yep, I think yes. it is, yeah. Yep. The presentation the and this video. Yep, and the plan is we'll have some more of these meetings once we get the, again, we haven't aged that 2022 data, so we really want to see what our growth is in 2022, um, and then we'll present that this winter when we'll do some more public meetings. Has Jeff done any, like, recent delayed mortality studies on anything, like whether it's an 11 inch or you know, thrown back into 72 degree water in three foot of water or a big fish released over deep water. I mean, I've, I've looked, but the last thing I can find that has anything to do with GFP is like 91. No, so they just completed one uh, about a year and a half ago, Cade Lyons, he was working through SDSU and he was doing a deep hooking mortality study. And what he found out was about 30 feet. Once you hit 30 feet mortality, particularly in the winter time, which is surprising, skyrockets you know once you get past 30 you start seeing mortality of your fish you know, approaching 90 percent at that point and it's not that the fish come belly up right away we released them in the these big vertical net pens like 60 foot tall 20 feet wide so the fish could swim down if it wanted to just like it would you know naturally if you took a fish off the hook threw it in the water we wanted to replicate that and delayed mortality so the fish swims down but you come back a day later and it's you know it's dead um, so anytime you guys are fishing over 30 feet of water, start being cognizant that a lot of those fish are not going to make it. And then that only gets worse the deeper you go to. It's in the process of being published. Yep. Dylan just reminded me it's in the process of being published right now, but we can put that on our website too, that study. Is this PowerPoint going to be available online? Yes. Yes, it'll be on our website. And then we'll send it out via email as well, and that will include this video too that's going to be on our YouTube. Yeah, go. I'm Bill Wackerly with the uh, <clears throat> Lake Hawaii Restoration Coalition. Just want to thank the Game Fish for coming and visiting with all of us, answering some of our questions. We're in this with the Game Fish and Parks for the long run, over 10 years at least, we figure. So we'd ask all of you to be supportive, get input to me if you'd like. We'll have a meeting in the not too distant future if we get some input, specific things that you think that we should do working with the game fishing parks. We want to facilitate the stocking of game, of uh, forage fish, of fingerlings. Uh, I don't necessarily like some of the numbers I see, but we'll talk about that in the future. And uh, we really want to work on facilitating these fish hatcheries. We want to get them up and running, and I know I appreciate what John said, and I've worked with the government and the state, how long it takes, <laughs> engineers and everybody, but there are some ways to fast track some of this stuff, and the guy sitting right here is an expert at it, but 
Well, that's the kind of things that the coalition wants to do. But we want to work close with game fish and parks. We want to make this a team effort so that the fishermen, the resort owners, the guides, everybody involved in fishing will now suffer from a severe economic impact because we're looking for trouble here if we don't get some walleye in Lake Hawaii and get them in there pretty quick. So and that's all we have. And again, thank you, Bill. I think the next meeting we should have is at the groundbreaking ceremony of the RAS <laughs> system at here. <laughs> well, well thanks next everybody. Month, wouldn't it? Yeah. Thanks everybody for coming out, and like I said, we'll be up here answering questions. I think the, the officers will be in the back if you have any questions, but yeah, feel free to come and chat and ask Thank us any questions. Why not? Thanks, guys.